the on each topic we discuss every week as well. And I believe so strongly that tonight you will be receiving keys, you will be receiving inspiration on how to rise above depression and stress. I mentioned earlier that each one of us can identify with, with the areas of discussion tonight, which is depression and stress, depending on you know, what you've experienced. You have experienced a certain degree of depression and or stress in your life. So please, let's pay attention and let's um, key in and be alert tonight. So my first question to you is, have you ever been depressed? And I can almost guarantee you that that question is 100% yes. Have you ever been stressed? That as well, you can identify with a degree of stress in your life and how you've been able to deal with that up until now. Well, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an issue and it's a question of the degree of wisdom you have been able to apply to your life to um, be able to handle the level of stress you experience, either that you're experiencing now or that you've experienced in the past. Right, I'm gonna talk a little bit about examples of some people who have experienced stress and mainly I want to focus on biblical examples. You know, thank God for the privilege of stories, history being documented in form of the Bible. And not just that, because the Bible is such a, a, a documentation of inspiration of people who were inspired by God and by God's spirit to put certain things together that we can now make reference to. And more importantly, it's the breath of God on his word that makes it even more powerful. So examples of people who have experienced depression and stress. And it's such a delight because this will even further make it clear to us that whatever it is we're going through today, whatever it is that we have experienced or will experience, it's not uh, strange. And it's not just, it's not new. It's not just us going through it. So let's look at the first example here, King David. He was a king, yet he experienced lots of stress. He experienced states of depression. And the depression he had, for example, uh, he was in a valley with, they called them men of valor. But at that point, they were broken. Their wives had been taken away from them. Their children had been taken. Everything they had had been taken from them. So at that point, all they felt was defeat. They felt loss. They felt they weren't really men. They couldn't fight for their families enough to be able to defend them. So at that point, they felt so low. They felt so low. Both King David and all his men in that cave, they were just there, just feeling so broken and so, you know, useless, so to speak. They felt like they were worth nothing. That's one story where we saw King David at his all-time low because, you know, something had happened to them that was like life really dealing them blows. Also, I think King David is, you know, his life was just such that we have various examples to give. King David as well, if you remember his story, himself and Bathsheba, after he had sinned, he felt such guilt he would hide himself. He would, you know, pray and, and seek God's face and ask for forgiveness. After that, and then, you know, when he committed adultery as well, same thing. When he killed, um, uh, you know, the man and took his wife, Bathsheba's husband, same thing. He felt such guilt. Straight after sinning, you know, he would feel so low, very low. And on and on like that. Just that sense of failure, that sense of discouragement we saw in King David's life. Another example is Elijah. 
And we know that Elijah, he was a prophet of that nation. He was a prophet. He was the prophet in that territory at that time. Yet, the Bible tells us that Elijah felt so low, he wanted to die. And he wanted to die. Why? Mainly because he was afraid. He feared one woman, not even the king, not even King Ahab. He feared Jezebel. He was afraid. He was a prophet of God. Yet he was scared. He ran away from town. He ran out of town into the wilderness, into the bush, into the jungle, because he was afraid. But, you know, that also points to that state of he was stressed and he was depressed. He didn't see he could do so much. He had low self-esteem. And yes, maybe he was even weary. Maybe he had, he, had, um, he had taken on so much. Maybe he was burnt out. So much could have been going on in his life at that point in time that he felt so low. And he felt like, even though he was the prophet, he felt like, well, I don't think I'm worth anything. He had such low self-esteem. Elijah, a whole Elijah ran out of town just because of fear for the enemy, fear for one woman. And another example is Jeremiah. Jeremiah, we know God called him. No, I don't like And as Jeremiah... No, I didn't like wet taste and you still please if there's noise in the background would you be able to mute your mic for us thank you very much thank you if there's noise in the background please mute your mic thank you all right I was talking about Jeremiah Jeremiah was a prophet and in Jeremiah 1 and verse 5 God tells us and as he was speaking to Jeremiah I knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb I had called you to be a prophet to the nations yet Jeremiah, he had esteem issues. He was scared. Oh, yes, we do understand he was young. He was probably a teenager or in his early adulthood, but he was scared because he thought, I, I, I don't have experience. I don't really know how to confront these people. I don't know how to, what to say to them. He perceived a lack of knowledge. He was insecure. That was Jeremiah. Also, Job is another good example for us to learn from. And understandably so, Job, he lost everything. I know that all of us, if not um, all of us, most of us would know the story of Job. Job lost all he had. I mean, one day, as one bad news is coming to him, another bad news is coming to him, the servant will run to him and say, Master, all the sheep have just disappeared. This has just happened. That had just happened. Everything he had, his children, everything he had was gone just like that. Job felt a sense of loss. He felt a sense of loneliness. Yes, he had friends around him, but those friends, they weren't helpful at all. Except for Elihu, who you know, after a while was able to talk some sense into him. After Job started saying rubbish and started cursing the day he was born, he felt lonely. Even his wife said, curse God, just curse God and die. He felt so lonely. He was devastated. He was in pain. Mm -hmm. He hadn't just lost everything. He was afflicted with sickness, with illness, with pain, sores, and boils all over him. He was really suffering. And we understand how he was able to fall into such depression. He was able to fall into such depression. He was really, really going through so much. But that's another example for us, a biblical example. Hannah was another one. And, you know, people like Hannah... If you know people like Hannah, in, in a day like today, you see sometimes people go around, they don't smile, they go around, you know, they look like they're fighting you, even when they're not looking at you. And it reminds me of um, Chadwick Boseman, who um, went, who passed on into glory just last week. How you never know what people are going through. 
you never know the pain, the stress, the weight that people have to bear on their shoulders every single day, every moment of their life, you never know. Which is, you know, just a reminder for us not to judge people based on, oh, well, why is she looking like that? She can't even greet me or she can't even smile. Why, 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 is, why, does she, why is she looking like she has all the weight of the shoulders on her head? Maybe she does. Maybe they do. You never know what people are going through. Hannah, for many years, she had no child and she was the other wife. And the other wife had children. You know, she was able to call this, call that. Anna was alone. She would have felt so lonely. She would, have, she would have felt she had no hope. She would have felt rejected. She would have felt like, what exactly was she living for? Until the point when she was bold enough at Shiloh, where they would go every uh, year, she was able to then just open up and just pour out a heart onto the one who is able to rescue her, to help her, and to give her the answers that she required. And she did so in wisdom, saying, Lord, if you can just give me this gift, I promise I'll give this gift back to you. <laughs> How wise was that? And God answered her. God answered her. Jonah was another one. Jonah, he was angry. And his anger was based on the fact that he didn't even want to accept what God had instructed him to do in the first place. He didn't want to accept it. God said, do this. Go to Nineveh, go and speak to the people. He was angry at the people because he thought maybe they're not even worth God's mercy. Or maybe he even doubted himself and he didn't want to accept. And he was so low. He was hiding here and there hiding on the ship. They threw him off the boat into the water and the whale picked him up, you know. And he, he experienced a level of stress as well. He experienced a level of stress. Another example I remember is Moses. Moses, he, that man, <laughs> the, the level of change and the level of topsy-turvy he, 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 he had gone through that he went through. It's amazing going from, you know, being in the creme de la creme of the society, being with the kings and the pharaohs and all of those, now being cast out into the wilderness. And he finding his purpose, you know, having an encounter with God, the burning bush right in front of him, God speaking to him out of a bush that's, that's on fire, yet not consumed, that was <laughs> such an encounter. And he had to find his purpose. He had to, to find the way out. He had to know what is the next thing for him to do. And then after going through all of that for the people, he went away to seek the face of the Lord, divine direction. He came back and the people were misbehaving. People react to depression and stress in various ways. And I won't, um, you know, belabor it. I won't talk too much about it because we have Dr. Lydia who will be speaking to us about it, especially from, you know, an experience and a professional point of view tonight. There's some, just some things that we can, underlying things that we can um, link from all of these people that I've just spoken about fear, despair, lack of wisdom. People don't see that there's a way out. There's so much trouble. There's too much to handle. Things seem to be out of control. There's so much anxiety. There's a lot of pressure. There seems to be no help. There's helplessness, sense of failure. There's darkness, there's shame. There's no light. There's hopelessness. There's loss, death, loneliness pain, affliction, sickness, attack in the mind. And this is very big. In fact, this is such a topic that we cannot fully explore tonight. But it's good that we discuss it. It's good we bring things to light. It's good that we allow the light of God shine on these areas of our lives. 
lack lack of you know things that we need that we want to lay our hands upon but they're not there they seem to be they seem to be out of reach no hope which is still hopelessness and so much more mm. Mm. this is one key thing i need you to know before i bring our speaker up for tonight i need you to know this i need you to strongly know this when you can get to the point where you know what i'm about to tell you you know it beyond every reasonable doubt when you get to the point that you know nobody has to remind you and you know this without an inch of doubt in your mind you get it you get it so here's what i need you to know tonight and for the rest of your life you are not alone at this point, I'd like everybody to unmute your mic. Please unmute your mic. And I need you to personalize this to yourself and tell yourself, I am not alone. 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 People remember. Remember, every Sister day you Sarah. wake up, remember, in everything you do, remember that you are not alone. You are not hopeless. You are not helpless. You are not without help. You are not alone. And when I say you are not alone, I mean in every area, you are not alone. Spiritually, you are not alone. Professionally, you are not alone. Whatever it is that you need, there is help. There's a solution to whatever the mountain is. There's a leveled ground. You are not alone. You are not alone. You are not alone. I love John 16 and verse 32. And he, Jesus himself, actually Jesus himself was one who experienced stress and depression, believe it or not. The Bible says he's, he was a man of like passions and he was a man of sorrow that was acquainted with grief. He knew. He's our high priest. And in John 16 and verse 32, he said, yet I am not alone. The father is with me. What a consolation. And he knew it. He knew when he was on the cross. I mean, that was like the, that was the, the, you know, the, the top, the, the highest pain bearing the weight of the whole world on his shoulder when he was up there for you and I, when he was there, he knew that God could not behold him in that state of sin. He knew yet he knew that the father was still, was still, he was still in the will of God and he still had hope. He had hope that once he passed that state, once he went past that phase, there is victory. So whatever it is that you're going through, I want you to know that there is victory on the other side. Don't give up now. Don't give up right now. Don't, don't end it. Don't give up now. Don't give up hope. There is hope. You cannot give up. You cannot give up. There's a story, I mean, some of us might have read the book, Man's uh, Search for Meaning. If you haven't read that book, please take the name down. You have to read it. It is such a deep book. Apart from the fact that it was based on, you know, Victor Frankl, he was a survivor of the Holy Holocaust. Apart from that, the, 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 you know, the things that come out of the book, it is amazing. It is amazing. And truly, we don't have much time. We don't have much time. I really um, want to bring our speaker on. So I will go ahead and I'll do just that. Just a reminder for us, get your questions ready. Mute your mic until the question and answer time. Also remember to use the chat box. All right, this is the time where we welcome our guests today. As we've said earlier, we're discussing rising above depression and stress. 
So our guest tonight, Dr. Lydia Success Ling. She is a chartered psychologist, HCPC registered practitioner, counseling psychologist. She is an associate um, psychology counseling lecturer at the Uni of Bedfordshire. She's also CEO at Inner Look Psychological Therapy. She currently works with the NHS in an eating disorder service. She's married with, and she's a mother of two adult men. She's an expert in perinatal mental health and eating disorders. She's a visionary of Impact Prayer Ministry, which is an intercessory prayer ministry. Her passion includes prayer, intercession, making a difference in the lives of people. Her interests, I love this, taking exotic holidays and Formula One motorsport. That is amazing. Dr. Lydia, next time you're going on your exotic holidays, please include me. And I like for Formula One as well. So people, please unmute yourselves, put your hands together and let us welcome Dr. Lydia Ling to speak to us. Are you clapping? Okay. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. I can see yeah. you. Yes. Welcome. Okay. Welcome. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. I was just thinking maybe we'll just uh, share the grace now because uh, you've said it all. <laughs> <laughs> it's an area of passion maybe for we'll me. Just say the grace. <laughs> Right. Yes. Um, yeah. Thank God for this opportunity. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Queen. Um, personally, this is one of uh, those kind of invitations I just couldn't turn down. Honestly, I just couldn't, but I know I am really, really busy. Oh. Um, I, I know, you know your passion uh, for the things of God, and mm. I celebrate your humility. Oh. I just want to thank everyone that is tuning tonight. I have some of my beloved friends around. I don't know who and who because I'm just using my phone. I know I've seen Doris, I've seen Shara, and I know there are a few others. I will, you know, try and see you later. But thank you all for this opportunity. I just want to really appreciate God for this opportunity and the grace to be able to put a few things down in spite of my very busy schedule. And uh, it is my hope and prayer that someone, at least one person, will be impacted tonight. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So it is a bit strange, you know, for me to be doing a presentation that is almost two different, you know, perspectives you know mm. um, I am kind of like going to start from the psychological aspect and then dive into the biblical side of things okay. so um, I'm just gonna go through uh, you know an overview of the scientific you know um, understanding of depression and stress and uh, I'll look at some causes some you know um, triggers I will look at some you know, um, medical diagnosis, if you don't mind. I know some of my friends were like, why are you talking about diagnosis? But I just want to give us a, you know, a brief knowledge, you know, an overview knowledge because as a psychologist, I cannot talk about depression without really bringing psychological aspects. We might not generally agree to all of them, but uh, depression is not something that we look at from one single aspect of life or from one perspective. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to start by talking about, you know, what depression is about from the psychological and medical points of view. So depression is a mood disorder. Uh, yes, I have my slides. So depression is a mood disorder that causes persistent feeling of sadness. 
you know, in, when people are depressed, they, they, they lost interest or pleasure in things they normally enjoy. Those are the basic symptoms, and that's how di di as a depression is diagnosed. Mm -hmm. So he, when people feel this kind of way, they, you know, it affects how they feel, you know. When people are sad, it affects how they feel, it affects how they think, and it affects how they behave. And this interferes with their ability to function and carry, out, carry on with their daily lives. As most of us may know, depression is the most common type of mental health illness. And according to the World Health Organization, it affects more than 260 million people worldwide. The effect of depression can be long lasting if left untreated. So what am I saying? Depression needs to be attended to, it needs to be treated, by whatever means. So we will look at ways to treat depression as we go on tonight. So I'm gonna look at the causes of depression. You know, there are many causes of depression and some of them we don't fully understand. Some researchers argue that it is biological. Others suggest brain function. But the majority, the vast majority of you know, researchers suggest psychosocial factors. There are different types of depression. There are, but there are two you know, main types of depression we have the normal or what we call regular depression, and then we have the clinical depression. So I know most of us may or may not understand the differences. So the clinical depression is the depression that is the diagnosed type of depression. Uh, there are so many, which of course I don't have so much time tonight to dive into, but I will do my best. I'm going to take them in sequence. So, regular depression is what we call the situational depression. Just like what Pastor Queen has just discussed, citing examples from the scripture. So we know that depression is not peculiar to a group of people or certain class of people. It is common to all. So um, there are so many things that happen to us in life that you know, make us feel depressed. And nobody is exempted. Even our Lord Jesus Christ, like we heard you know, Pastor uh, Quinn mention, our Lord Jesus Christ, he was great. He was depressed. King David, so many people in the Bible. But we're going to look at how we're going to you know, um, the, the examples and how we're going to learn and what we're going to learn from those biblical examples. So, you know, for example, if somebody, you know, losing a, lo a loved one, it's a normal situation that many, many people will react to with a depressed mood. Bereavement, grief, it brings, it makes us feel sad. It makes us, it affects how we feel. Because we've lost, we've lost a loved one. And it's genuine, it's normal to feel sad in such circumstances. <laughs> and another thing that makes people depressed, very, uh, another very common depressed <laughs> is when we have illness. You know, when we're unwell, it limits our ability to function. And if you can't function, of course you're not going to feel happy. However, if we do not, you know, treat or do something about how we feel for a period of time, we allow it to, to extend, it can lead to major depression. And this is what we call psychosomatic illness. What I mean by psychosomatic illness is physical illness turning to psychological illness. 
you know, you have, a, you know, like some people go through operation, you know, have, you know, are diagnosed with, you know, physical health. Because of how they feel, they begin to have psychological reaction. Some people start by having psychological reaction and become ill physically. So they go hand in hand. Physical health can affect our psychological health and psychological health can affect our physical head, and that's what we call psychosomatic illness. Now, um, I'm also going to talk about, you know, how our depression become a disorder. It's not every depression that is a disorder. So, and this is something we have to know and we have to be aware of. Depression becomes a disorder or chronic when it is persistent and problematic. It can be mild to severe, and it involves a variety of symptoms. And these symptoms can be emotional and they can be physical. You know, things like, you know, irritability, like depressed or irritable mood. These are symptoms of depression. When we have problem with our sleep, for example, sleeping too little or sleeping too much, or sleeping during the day. These are symptoms. Fatigue could be a symptom of depression, lack of interest in activities we usually enjoy, poor concentration, excessive or unrealistic low self-image, agitation, or severe anxiety or panic attack could be a symptom of depression. Sometimes people who are depressed have the experience suicidal thoughts. Some people even actually commit suicide because they are depressed. And that is because they don't know how to rise above it. So there are so many other symptoms of depression that we might not be able to take tonight. But however, medically or clinically, according to the DSM, I know my friend would not like me to talk about DSM, but I will, Cheryl. So, you know, so according to the DSM, which is the Diagnostic Statistical Manual for Mental Disorder, if a person experiences the majority of the above symptoms every day or most of the day for two weeks or more, they will often be diagnosed with MDD, which is what we call major depressive disorder. And uh, the, 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 this major, there are, a, there are categories of major depressive disorders. And this involve, include um, SAD. I know many of us might be you know, conversant with that uh, frame. SAD, it stands for Seasonal Affective Disorder. And then we also have what we call Persistent Depressive Disorder. And we have what we call bipolar. It used to be known as Manic Depression. And I know most of us are familiar with this type of depression. And also we have perinatal, which is my area of interest. If I say interest, expert, right. And um, I may not have enough time to go into all of them and the symptoms and how. I just want to quickly go to the perinatal depression. This is my area of expert. I love it. And I love to talk about perinatal. If you give me the whole day, I'll talk about perinatal mental health. It covers attenental and because it's, 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 it's relevant to us women, and I know majority of us on the, on the uh, I know there are some men on, on, <laughs> online, but majority are women. And this is very relevant and peculiar to women. There is, it covers antenatal and postnatal depression. Different factors also are responsible for this type of depression. Also, there is the argument for, 
you know, bio, biological causes such as hormonal changes. But this cause has been largely disputed in, in research. So psychosocial, again, predisposition to postnatal depression is largely suggested by research. This is more than the baby blue. We know, we know the baby blue in the perinatal period, you know, things like mood change, anxiety, irritability, and other symptoms are common after giving birth and often last for about two weeks. But postnatal symptoms, postnatal depression symptoms are more severe and long lasting. It can last up to one year. And it can, carry on from one child to the another. And the danger is if we feel depressed and there are actually issues around us that are not dealt with, that make us feel depressed, and from one child to the other, we do not address those issues, we can run the risk of becoming psychotic. And that what we call, um, it's called the uh, psychotic depression. It's called post postpartum psychosis, you know, which is still postnatal, you know, psychosis, and that happens very quickly within the first five days of giving birth to a baby, and it can be a carry forward of depression that was not treated. Right. So. As a woman and as a mother, we have to be aware of the peculiar symptoms of postnatal depression. They could involve severe mood swing, feeling of sadness, social withdrawal, bonding with the baby, appetite change, feeling of hopelessness and helplessness that's common. It can also, in rare cases, involve thought of hurting yourself or your baby, or even thought of suicide. As a clinician, when you experience these symptoms, you definitely need support. You definitely. And that support could be medical and it could be psychological intervention, depending on the symptoms and how they manifest. Again, if left untreated, it can lead to lasting side effects. And when a woman, I don't know if any of you has, you know, come across someone or a lady that suffered with, you know, postpartum psychosis. It is a very bad situation. And it usually involves hospitalization. It involves episode, you know, that is accompanied with confusion hallucination and delusions. It is very, very bad. And if you haven't experienced it, it's a bad condition. So, and that brings us to the importance of paying attention to your depressive symptoms and mood and doing something about it. You cannot afford to leave your depression or stress unattended to. Otherwise, we are asking for more trouble. Generally, we suffer, when we suffer with depression, we can often find ourselves feeling hopeless and isolated. It's very common. But when we develop negative and self-destructive behavior and, and believe that undermine our happiness and mental and physical well-being, why trying to look for solution by yourself or trying to hide it or deny it? And I just want to quickly talk about stress. So again, we are looking at two different, you know, very important, you know, topics tonight. Stress is something that is also very, very, you know, important and a very complicated condition that we can suffer. Again, it's common to everyone. Psychologically, it is the uh, psychologically and physiologically, it is the body's reaction. It's a physiological reaction that is the body reaction 
So any change that requires an adjustment or response, stress is a, like a demand. The body reacts to these changes with physical, mental, or emotional responses. Stress is a normal part of life. Biologically, stress is a physical, mental, and emotional factor that causes bodily or mental tension. And it can cause or influence the cause of many medical and psychological conditions, such as depression and anxiety. So in a way, it is a bit difficult to separate depression, anxiety, and stress. They are like siblings. More often, people who suffer depression, they will suffer with anxiety and stress. Or people who suffer with stress will suffer with depression and experience anxiety. So often, they cannot, they go hand in hand. And stress, could be normal or chronic. I don't know how much time I got. So stress could be normal or chronic. Everyone has different stress triggers. The work top the list, according to research. Loss of love born again, getting married, moving to a new home, chronic illness or injury, traumatic events such as natural disaster, rape, or violence against you, know, you or someone else. The body is designed to experience stress and react to it. And stress can be positive. Stress can be positive. You know, I know some people will probably be thinking, how? Yes, and I will explain. Stress can be positive. It keeps us alert. Stress can keep us motivated and ready to avoid danger. Stress only becomes negative when a person faces continuous challenges without relief or relaxation between stressors, different things that make us feel stressed. So as a result of that, the person can become overworked and stress-related tension will not build up. Now, I go into a little bit of psychology again. The body autonomic nervous system, very complicated part of our human being. It is a system that, is, that has a built-in stress response that causes physiological change, that is bodily change, to allow the body to combat stressful situations. It's built in us. It's like a shock observer or response, you know, um, a trigger, I mean, response uh, uh, factor in our system. So this stress response, also known as the fight and flight response, I know many of us may have heard that, the fight and fight response. So the fight and fight response has a natural way of responding. For example, I am in the room, I'm in the study here. I'm giving, I'm, I am in this session. If suddenly a dangerous animal comes into this room, what do I do? I don't have time to think of what to do. There is that instinctive reaction. The fight or flight or freeze, as some people will want to use the three of them together. So automatically you run. That thing that makes you run is a natural built instinct that responds to danger. The stress response, so it is activated in the case of in, in, in the case of an avenger, uh, emergency. However, this response can become chronically activated during prolonged periods of stress. When we react to things we stress on unnecessarily, prolonged activation of the stress response causes wear and tear on our body. 
And this can be both physical and emotional. Stress also can continue without relief. You know, the stress that continues without relief can lead to a condition which we call distress. So stress is, is different from distress. So when we are stressed, it is like an alarm clock. But when you become distressed, it becomes a condition. So it is a negative stress response that we begin to get used to and become part of the way we react. You, re you, you overactivate that natural response. And so because we activate that fight and flight mechanism, and, uh, you know, unnecessarily, so we condition our body so that even the slightest little thing will begin to react with stress. And when we do that often, we begin to create trouble for our body system. And this distress can, you know, can disturb the body internal balance, leading to physical symptoms such as elevated blood pressure stress. It can cause chest pain. It can cause stomach upset. It can lead to emotional problems, like I said before, like depression and some form of anxiety and worry. Even panic attack can also result from distress. Research suggests that stress also can bring on or worsen certain you know, symptoms or diseases. Stress is particularly linked to five of the leading causes of death, including heart diseases, cancer, lung alignment, accidents, and you know, suicide, stress, very dangerous. So let's just look at a few um, warning signs of stress. You know, you know, dizziness can be a warning sign, general aches and pain, headache, muscles tension. I'm just going to quickly fast forward because I'm looking at the time. So I think, you know, you can see it on the slide. I don't have the time to go into, you know, normal stress. You know, we have the normal stress and the chronic stress. I may not have time to go into it. But chronic stress is that grindy stress that wear people away day after day. That is a very, very risky type of stress and it can be, you know, it can be linked to our childhood experiences, past negative experiences, something that happened to us that we carry, you know, we, we, we carry in the, in, you know, you know, forever, you know, it's forever present you know, and painful. And so because of that, we tend to develop some self-concepts and core beliefs or schemas, as we call them. Don't really have time for all of this tonight, honestly. But yeah, you know, so th th there's so much to talk about these things. But yeah, some, some of the stress that people suffer that leads to Chronic stress are those stress that stem from, you know, from you know, traumatic events. So we develop, you know, certain kind of belief, a way, a system that we live, we, we, we view the world with, our personality, you know, we develop certain type of personalities, you know, from this kind of experiences, rules for living, you know, like, for example, you know, you, you know, experiences as a child. You know, for example, some people can develop, you know, um, rules for living or develop core, cops, um, core beliefs uh, of, you know, I must be perfect at all times. And sometimes you see people live those kind of life. It's very stressful to live a life of, you know, as, you know put yourself under that kind of stressful, you know, um, way of living. But sometimes if you look in depth, it is not something that is something on the surface. It's something that's something. It's, it's deep seated. It's deep seated and it's something that needs to be worked on. And it's not something because once it has been there for so long, it becomes difficult for you to actually understand why you are the way you are that you don't even like. So there's so much to that. There's so much to, to that. And you definitely need a professional to help you 
you know, assess your core belief, your, your schemas. Um, I'm just going to, you know, uh, leave uh, stress there and quickly go into Bible examples and encouragement. I know Pastor um, Queen has spoken quite a lot about biblical examples. I just want to look at Paul. Paul was another person in the New Testament that went through a lot of affliction. You know, Second Corinthians, you know, one. I mean, Second Corinthians one eight to nine said, "For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experience in Asia." For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despair of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. They lost hope. There was no hope. But what did he say? say but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. So now, let's look at that. You know, the Bible says, by strength shall no man prevail. And the Bible recommend that we should cast all our cares upon him because he cares for us. The apostles, they were so despaired to the, to the point of losing hope of life. But that was to make them rely more on God and not on themselves. Like, you know, um, Pastor uh, Queen said, just to realize that you are not on your own. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. So what about Peter, James, and the rest of the apostles? They suffered such great affliction that depression and stress would have been another statement for them. But what did they do? They held on to God unfailingly, the God that is the author and finisher of faith. You know, Queen mentioned the, uh, uh, King David. We cannot talk about depression without talking about King David. We cannot, because it's a practical example for, you know, as example of, you know, biblical characters that experience depression and how they dealt with it. David prayed to God in the time of trouble. Depression is a time of trouble. If you see people that are clinically depressed, you will know that depression is not a joke. It's not a joke. So, and what did David do? Well, that is, it's not above our God. No matter how strong that depression is. He said, why am I so depressed? Why this turmoil within me? But he said, put your hope. He was talking to himself. He said, put your hope in God, for I will still praise him, my Savior and my God. Said, why, are you my, why are you downcast, my soul? Now, what is the learning from here? The learning from King David is to is the skill and strategy of prayer. Is the strategy of calling yourself to caution and challenging your feelings and thoughts with the word of God. As I in the heart of man, Proverbs 12, 25, causes depression. But he said, but a good word makes it glad. Again, what do we say to ourselves? Self-talk. Self-talk is one of our psychological skills that we use. And it's right here in the Bible for you and I as believers. So let me just... Fast forward to Isaiah 26.3. Isaiah 26.3, what did he say? He said, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trusting God for healing of any sort is a key to recovery and deliverance. Mental health problems you know, or disturbances is absent essentially absence of peace and the bible says my peace i give to you the peace of god surpasses any medical or psychological healing that may be out there 
And Peter says, we should cast all of our cares, for he cares for us. He said, be vigilant, be sober, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a rolling lion seeking whom he may devour. And he also said, we should resist him, be steadfast in faith, knowing that the same suffering are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. No one is exempted. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory, by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, establish perfect, strengthen, and settle you. I'm looking at the time now. So, um, again, besides normal trials of life, there is demonic attack that can cause depression and stress. Take it or leave it. We, therefore, we need to be vigilant as believers. We need to be wise and discerning. The Bible says we should resist him and be steadfast in faith. A general rule for believers is to address the spiritual root of any situation or illness before seeking out support. Prayerfully and faithfully rebuke any symptoms and claim your healing promises of God. I am not suggesting that we do not need psychological support, but I'm saying as believers, the general rule is to start from the spiritual root. Now, I don't know whether I have the time. How am I doing with time? You're good. If you can go the next 10 minutes, slash 15 minutes, we're good. Okay. So, this thing came into my mind when I was preparing my message. Two distinct attitudes that can trigger depression in believers or stress. There are things we must be aware to challenge in our Christian living. And one of them is disobedience. We um, know many of us, we must be conversant with the story of Saul, how he lost his throne after his disobedience to God. He said, but the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and a distressing spirit, 1 Samuel 16, 14. From the Lord, a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. Another version says, now the spirit of the Lord has left Saul and the Lord sent a tormenting spirit that filled him with depression and fear. This is taking us to another dimension. We need to be careful as Christians because sometimes depression or stress may be self-inflicted. Another one is envy, a resentful longing or discontentment aroused by someone else's possessions desiring things that belong to others to the extent that it imparts your peace and joy. This can bring stress and depression. And this is definitely self-inflicted. So there is no better example of jealousy than the story of D Joseph's brothers. We know the story as well. And how long they have to carry that stress, you know, just because of envy. God can deliver and save us from day-to-day -day issues that lead to depression. God can deliver us from demonic afflictions that lead to stress. But if we self-inflict situation, particularly situation where God endorses our suffering, I wonder who will deliver us. So we need to be aware as Christians, as well as looking at the day-to-day -day things that make us stress, we should also be aware of things that we can bring upon ourselves. That's why the Bible says we should deliver ourselves, Zion. So let us not be considered provoking one another, envying one another. So there are other, you know, quotations. Let me just quickly go to the, my last uh, topic here. It says that the things and resources that can help us strive or rise above depression. So I've missed both the biblical and psychological, you know, resources together. So what, <laughs> I have missed them together. So one is to say, we must avoid denying depression. Do not deny it. Because why denial perpetuates it, it maintains it. Don't deny it, do not compromise it. It's like a Christian feeling, to acknowledge the devil if we deny depression because it's real. 
when we suffer with depression, stress or anxiety, it can seem like there is no end in, in sight. Or this is not true. It is about what you tell yourself. One of the things we can use to rise above depression is to be a prayer, a praiseful Christian or a praiseful believer. Psalm 71, 14 says, but I will hope continually and praise you yet more and more. And Habakkuk 3, 17 says, though the fruit tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vine, the product of only faith, and the field yet no food. So the flock be cut off from the fold, and there is no herbs in the stores. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Praiseful life. We must also learn to evaluate our, and challenge our thoughts. Where the full amount of God the helmet of salvation and the word of the spirit, which is the word, I mean, the, 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 yeah, which is the word of God. Take captive every thought, very important. Take captive every thought to the obedience of Christ, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Also, learn to accept that there are events that you cannot control. Because one of the reasons why most of us have problems with stress, especially stress, is because we want to control everything around us. We cannot. You, we have no power over, or we have no control over what life throws at us. The only thing we can do is, where we have our control, is what we do and our reaction or our reaction to the things that world throws at us. But when you try to control the uncontrollable, you feel stress and it can lead to depression in time. We must learn to keep a positive and realistic attitude. We must be assertive instead of aggression. A lot of people become aggressive when they are stressed. You have to learn to assert your feelings opinions or belief instead of becoming angry defensive or passive these are you know very common features for you know de depressed individuals or stressful individuals we must keep our hope and aspiration for the future alive dare to dream big and set achievable and stimulating goals and target something to look forward to this you can look forward to will help you to, we, we, we keep your mind from ruminating because most of the things is in our mind is battle of the mind so you need to get your mind positively engaged change your view of the world and your perspective in life learn how to address that overly critical inner voice very important we need to challenge it with the word of god our reaction and decision are very important to how we feel. Give it to the Holy Spirit on a daily basis for God to help your reactions and decisions. Give yourself a place to recover and be open. Don't be defensive. Again, it's very important. Do not be defensive. Admit it and just you know, seek help. Exercise is very good. Your body can fight stress better when it is fit. Healthy, eating healthy, well, time enough sleep and rest. Your body needs time to recover from stressful events. And do not rely on alcohol or, or, or drugs or any other thing, compulsive behavior to receive to reduce stress. It does not help. And also relationship. Things as small as having a close friend, someone you can confide in and trust can be helpful. Try to focus on people who lift you up. The Bible says two are better than one. Social support is very important. Seek a social network like joining a support group, serving in the ministry, a church, attending regular church or religious events or activities or meetings. Make times for hobby, interest and relaxation. Learn to practice relaxation technique. Try meditation for stress management. Meaning, find some ways to be of service to others. Better to give than to receive. Make others happy. Sow into others and enjoy the satisfaction and blessing that comes from it. Finally, 
finally, <laughs> finally, take things step by step. Use your self-talk strategy. You know, take example from King David, talk to friends, family, mentors, Christian mentors before considering, you know, um, professional support. That is if the situation remains challenging and difficult. Remember, if you go to your GP, and that may have its own negative impact. We can achieve the function of antidepressant by self-management. I can tell you this because I know. What tends to happen is that when we are depressed, the chemicals in our body get deregulated. So antidepressant regulates it quicker. That's why they give you antidepressant. But that, the, the, when, it, when, when you are acutely depressed, you know, when you are acutely depressed, the antidepressant will bring it down quicker, will help you regulate the chemicals. But you can regulate your chemicals by yourself. However, antidepressant can be additive. We have to be you know, very careful. It can be additive. I can only say this to you as a believer because I know we have resource in Christ. We do not lose hope like the worldly people. We have hope. So there is a place for medication. There is a place for psychological intervention. But where I will go first is to God. So, that's me done, and I'm really sorry I've taken so much of your time. So I thank you guys for listening. God bless you all. <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Lydia. That was an awesome, awesome talk. Thank you for speaking to us on the topic of depression and stress, how to overcome those two issues. And uh, you've spoken a lot. And right now, it's time for question and answer. I'm so happy you touched on antidepressants because that was one of the things I planned to ask. Um, I've seen people who, you, you did say they're addictive. I've seen people who um, antidepressants were prescribed to them by the GP, by the doctors. And for years, they remain on the same antidepressant. And sometimes they change the type. And for some reason, you know, it's meant to make them get better, but then actually not getting better. So I, I, I am happy that you, you touched on that. If you can just talk to us a little bit more about it. I, uh, I, there's this lady I know who, um, I mean, for a long time, I never knew one-on-one -on -one people who use antidepressant, but in recent times, I've come to know people who have been placed on antidepressants and uh, this particular lady I'm, I'm, I'm talking about, she has two young children. She's taking antidepressants and it's like taking sugar because it works for a certain time in the day. And then after that, she just drops, like she just drops and becomes so low. So really, I don't know if it's, if it's helping, if it's helping her get better. Um, and I'm happy you, 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 know, you gave us a Christian perspective to it, to run to God first. But for someone like that, what would be the best way to help her? She's been on it for about three, four years. And it doesn't seem like it's really, really helping. So can you give us a professional perspective to it, as well as a Christian perspective to it? Please. Yeah, thank you, um, Pastor Queen. Yeah, yeah, like I just quickly uh, touched on it. The thing is that, like I was trying to explain, you know, what tends to happen when we are depressed is I, I'll give a layman explanation of what tends to happen. Imagine, you know, that there is, a, you know, the flow, a stream of water, you know, flowing and trying to get to, you know, um, another big pond of water. And as they go, what tends to happen? Someone goes there and drop like a stone or something. I won't happen. The water will split everywhere. Mm. And then when you watch that stream, you see the water, they, they kind of like trying to come back to that flow. Yeah. And for some, it takes time. 
So what tends to happen is that in our system, we, there are chemicals. I don't want to, you know, it's too biological and too psychological. I don't want to, I just want to use layman's, you know, language. So these are chemicals in our bodies. And the these chemicals, the, the messages are sent and they go through certain, you know, in a, there's, a, there's a part they take to distribute messages, the neurons in our system. They distribute messages to the brain, to the hands, to every part. But when we are overly stressed and depressed, those chemicals, they miss their ways. They mm -hmm. don't know how to go and send these messages. So what happens is that when you've done it for too long, because if you relax and you do all of this, most of these things that I say you should do, and you bring yourself to that place of relaxation, the chemicals will find their way in time. But when you don't need it and it becomes acute and chronic, mm -hmm. just like stress, people that stress over everything, and it become, the body be, gets so used to that stress, and they respond to even an ant with stress. And it's a build-up. So what tends to happen when you are acute and you can't do anything anymore and you're so bad, you go to the GP, the GP give you antidepressant. What happens, antidepressant will help you to regulate those chemicals quickly. Mm. But, and then antidepressant is something you shouldn't be on for. I can't tell you, I can't give you time, but you shouldn't be on antidepressant for more than six weeks. I mean, six months, mm. to be honest. So, because on the long run, the antidepressant, it gets used to you. It doesn't do nothing. Mm. So what you see when people are, you know, getting worse is the depression that is getting worse because the antidepressant is no longer working. It's done what it has to do. Mm. So what you need to solve your problem, you can you can see a psychologist. Yeah, there are so many things we you know talk about what is happening, look for skills and strategy, understand what's happening, or biblically, go to God. As a Christian, find out what's going on. Is this natural? Is this an affliction? Is there anything in my life that I need to take care of? Or am I overreacting to the issue that happened? That, you know, am I overreacting? Find a mentor. Find a friend to talk to. Find someone and help yourself. So I will not recommend extended use of antidepressants. Mm. Mm. thank you thank you very much all right people now it's time for you to uh, ask your questions please unmute yourself and let us ask dr lydia the questions that we have feel free to unmute yourself and please ask thank you madam that was very insightful especially i liked your biblical side of perspective my question is, can you be depressed even if you have, like, if you have everything already, but still can you be depressed? <laughs> of course, yes. See, you can, depression has no, um, it's not a respecter of anybody. The thing is that when you look at depression, you see, there are different, different things that make people depressed. Mm -hmm. So what makes A depressed might not be what makes B depressed. And the way we look at people, sometimes you look at someone that has, you know, from the human perspective, you look at this person, he's rich, he has everything. But there is something in their life that is not quite right. We don't know it. And the problem is that they probably don't know how to manage that aspect of their life. We mm -hmm. see them, I think they are happy. They've got everything. Depression has nothing to do with your possession. It's experiences of life. Like I couldn't go into chronic stress. You know, people that are chronically stressed, it's not about what happened in the past, in their childhood, that they have carry with them so there's so many things and when you you think you have everything and you are not happy it is time to explore what might be going on both psychologically and publicly or spiritually as it were 
Does that answer your Thanks question? Yeah, yes. Fantastic. And one more question. Can we be depressed without knowing why? Like without any reason? Well, it depends on you as a person. Usually, the unless maybe again it's something from the past unless again it's attached to traumatic experiences because that's what I was trying to say before some people you know like the day-to-day -day stress is easy to recognize because why it is um, it's new and you can immediately see why I am stressed but some people are stressed they cannot really see it. It's not as if, if you search, you will find why you are stressed. But most of the time, like for some people that, that experience abuse, childhood abuse, childhood, you know, you know, or any sort of abuse, you know, there is something in their system. They are not happy. They can have everything in the world. But that pain, they have not been able to deal with that internal pain. You know, so they kind of carry that pain all their life. So that's where I said, when you have chronic stress, it, there are things that you cannot really put your hand to. That's why I was talking about schemas. They become schemas. They are embedded in us. You know, it's like, for example, you know, um, a child that, you know, for example, a child that, you know, growing up and always the parents, you know, tell them to do more and more, they might not be directly told to do more. For example, a child, you know, he goes to school, he comes out second in the class, and the child know that they've done so much, they put a lot of effort to come out second. But they come home with the result, and the parents say, what about the person that, took, that came out first? Mm. You see what I mean? Yeah. So there is something they're planning in the mind of that child. So that child, you know, he began to work hard. It, it, it was, it's, not, it's not suffering, it's not something that they are told, but it's just that human reaction. Oh, I need to work hard so that I can please my parents, so that I can come first. And they carry that along. That's why you see people who are rich, they want to get richer and richer, they struggle, they struggle, they're never satisfied because there's something in them, that pursuit of you know, pleasing others, you know, putting a lot of effort, professionalism, all sorts of things can be involved, but again, it's individual, and this is something you can explore with a professional. You know, you can explore with a psychologist. It will help you. You know, you do a formulation, you find out what might have happened in the past, and where those kind of feelings are coming from. Definitely, we do find it, but it's also not very easy because schemas are embed embedded. So you, as a, as a clinician, you also have to search and search with this person before we can get to the roots. Mm. So it is, it is possible. Mm. And like yeah. I said before, yeah. Oh yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, please, Kevin, yeah, you were saying something. Uh, no, 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 go on. Do you have any other question you want to ask? Uh, no, madam, that's it, thank you. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. So does anyone else want to ask a question now? You can use the chat box if you don't want to uh, say it vocally. Uh, Dr. Lydia, did you want to say something? No, I just want to talk about, you know, the, the um, because of her question, I wanted to just go into that chronic stress. Mm. Um, you know... <laughs> Like I was saying before, the normal stress is easy to notice or people are immediately aware of it because they know they can relate to what is happening in the here and now. But when it's chronic, it is very dangerous because the time, you know, and that, those, kind of, those kind of stress can actually kill. Mm. It can lead to, you know, all sorts of diseases, you know, because people are forever trying and trying, not understanding what's really going on. They have everything, but they cannot see that joy and happiness. Mm. But something is wrong somewhere, and it's something that they need looking, looking at and looking for. So, and in that case, you definitely need a professional to work along you, to help you find, why do I have everything, and yet I'm not happy? 
and yet I feel distress or stress. So there must be something in your past that's probably impacting how you feel in the present. Mm. Mm. Yeah. All right. I'll just quickly thank you so much for that, um, Dr. Lydia Ling. Thank you. We really appreciate all that you've shared with us tonight. I would like to share two quotes that I kind of um, skipped earlier because I wanted us to um, quickly have our guests uh, speak to us. So the first uh, quote I'd, I'd like to share with us by Viktor Frankl. I mentioned that book earlier, Man's Search for Meaning. And also just to say that many of, um, there are many little things we can do to actually ensure that we don't fall into, like Dr. Ling said, chronic depression or a high level of stress. There, there's a lot. We don't want the negative stress, like she explained. Positive stress, it keeps you alive. It keeps you alert. It keeps you going. But you don't want to experience the negative stress. And if you see that you're tending towards negative stress, then you have to quickly act on it and make sure that you bring your life back into balance. And you can, there are little things you can do. She mentioned uh, support groups earlier. I remember when we did um, our first series that I took with us people, some people are on here that were with us for the entire eight weeks. Remember I mentioned something about having a, an SSS, which I termed solid support system. You, I mean, these things are things that you choose to just put in your life. They're, they're systems. They're things you, you choose to employ, things you choose to adopt into your life that will make your life easy, that will make your life stress-free, that will make your life depression-free. So I'll share this, um, this quote with us. And here's Viktor Frankl saying, there is nothing in the world, I venture to say, that would so effectively help one to survive even the worst conditions as the knowledge that there is a meaning in one's life. And you know, I said to you earlier that you are not alone. You have to remember that every day of your life, you are not alone. And this quote also points to the fact that you as an individual, you as a person must know that there is purpose to your life. There's meaning to your life. You know, when you get to the point where you know that my life has a meaning, I'm not worthless. My life, you know, is packed full of purpose. And there's a reason I'm here. And every day I live, I am living in purpose. I'm walking in the reason for my existence. It boosts your hope. It boosts your faith. It makes you come alive. Every time you wake up, it makes you find a new realization, a new reason to keep going. So let's move on to the next um, quote that I want to share with us. And this is by Nietzsche, who says, he who has a why to live, for can bear almost anyhow. If you know that there's a why for you to live for, there's something ahead of you, there's a future for you to look forward to, it keeps your hope alive. Regardless of, this, of the circumstance and what you have to go through to get there, your hope will be kept alive. Your hope will be kept alive and you'll find the passion every day to overcome whatever you know, could come your way, which includes the different kinds of stress that life throws at us. Just little ways you can learn to manage stress and to be on top and to overcome these negative things that life throws at us. Simple things like managing your time well. And you know, today, this uh, modern age, we have technology to help us make our lives better. Even though sometimes that's not the case, you know, as if technology is actually taking over many people's lives. But you have to be able to master it and really let technology help you. You have apps that help you manage your time. That was, you know, you set reminder, reminders. I set reminders. I know most of us would, would do that. You set reminders on your phone so that you don't forget appointments and they remind you 
an hour before, a day before, a week before, you know, you do your, have your to-do list. I talk about my to-do list, you know, often when I speak to people, I have your to-do list. And then you go back to your to-do list to um, see what you've been able to achieve. And you know how result motivates you. It gives you just that boost that, yes, I was able to set those goals and now I've gone back to them and, you know, I can then set more goals for tomorrow and know that I will achieve most of it and whatever I can achieve, just because I've been able to prioritize the most important thing that I want to achieve. And yes, maybe 80%, 90% of them I was able to achieve. That's good enough. I'll move them to the, you know, the next day or the next week or however you set your goals. Just the other day, I went back to my year's goal and I see that over 70% of it has been achieved already. Part of the goals I set for this year was to have Thrive Seminars. And what are we having right now? Which only started from like maybe the first three weeks of the lockdown. Every week we meet and, you know, we have Thrive Keys that we, we share, which is an awesome thing. He who has a why to live for can bear almost anyhow. Something as, uh, you know, common or as seemingly insignificant as turning on music. Dr. Ling spoke earlier about praise. So you don't, even if you don't feel like singing, you can just go to YouTube, you know, go on, on Spotify or any of your streaming platforms, just turn up music, happy music, godly music, and set an atmosphere for yourself. I did this a lot. I remember years ago, I used to feel so sad. I used to feel so down because for me, I knew that God made me for something, but nothing around me really uh, uh, represented that. At that point, I, I, I remembered thinking, okay, when was the last time something significant happened to me in my life? It was, it was a, a, a really low point in my life at that point. And I remember very well, one key thing that I did was music. And most of you know that uh, myself, my family, my husband, my chil our children, we're a family of music. We love music. We love to write and sing, you know, music. Just turn up the volume. Get yourself into that mode and into that place where, you know, you boost yourself, boost yourself. And something else I love that Dr. Lydia spoke to us about earlier is self-talk. Mm. That inner voice. What exactly are you permitting? Because <laughs> don't tell me that you don't have power over that. You do. You do. You can. So even if the negative voice is saying to you, well, you know that you're, you're not worth much. You know that, you know, you can't really achieve more. You know that limitation in you. You know that you're, you're, a, you're a C student. You know, you know that you, you can't you can't achieve it. You know that in your family, there's always a limit. You will never go beyond achieving a, 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 a first degree, a bachelor's degree. You know that you can't go beyond the 25K a year threshold uh, 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 annual income. You have the power to resist and to redefine the voice that you permit to sit on your mind seat. You can. And because, especially for every believer, every Christian, every child of God, you can, by the word of God, by the power of his word, begin to change those evil and negative narratives that the enemy just, you know, suggests to you. You can change it and begin to rewrite it by the word of God. So when you begin to hear those voices to say, you know, that, you know, you're always, you're always behind. You're always behind. You say, no, God has said to me that I am the head only. I am not below. I'm not beneath. I am above only. I am not at the bottom. You can rewrite greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You can rewrite. You can re believe positive things about yourself. You can learn to reteach yourself what God says about you because that is truth. 
not what your experiences, not what your abusers have uh, taught you to believe about yourself, not what the negative experiences that you have, uh, uh, you have been through. If you have a why to live, you can be almost anyhow. So yet again, Dr. Lydia, thank you so, so much for coming on tonight. It's been such uh, a delight and such a blessing to hear all that you've had to say to us about depression and about stress. So people of God, remember that you can truly rise above depression and you can rise above stress. All right. Mm. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> At this point, um, I want to encourage everyone to keep in touch with us. Please keep in touch with us. My name is Queen Great, and um, on Instagram, I'm the Queen Great. You can email us, I thrive at queengreat.com. Dr. Lydia, please tell us how we can be in touch with you. You're a chartered psychologist. And I remember years ago, I don't remember how many years now, but I remember that uh, many years ago, you even invited me to do, do that um, Christian counseling uh, qualification. So please tell us, I know you're, you're a, a qualified and registered, accredited uh, Christian counselor as well. So if you could please tell us how we can get in touch with you. Mm, how you can get in touch with me? Go get in touch with me with my email. I'm not on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> and you know you can get in touch with me, Queen. Get in I touch do. with me. I do. And let them get in touch with me through you. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay, that's good. That's good. That's good. Thank you so much. So before we go, any questions? I don't want you contacting me later and telling me, Pastor Queen, you left me out. So if you have any questions, just stop me and let's um, still ask Dr. Lydia while we have her. All right. Last week we mentioned our book challenge. And this is you getting your own copy of I Thrive book. And then you order it on Amazon, you contact us, let us know that you've ordered it and you get your own free I Thrive t-shirt sent to you. So that's the mm. first um, announcement. The next one is you do a video, do a video, say what this actually, I need you to start sending it in. I thank everyone that has sent in their own pictures of um, them in their lovely I Thrive t-shirts so far. Thank you for that. Please keep them coming. So next, you do a video of yourself talking about what your highlight has been in the past um, few weeks. This is our 10th week. So in the past 10 weeks, tell us what your highlight has been on this, I th on this Thrive Keys series. And, you know, let us know. The due date for that is 17th of September. All right, so here I love this so much. This is where we read out and we personalize our Thrive verse. Our Thrive verse today is taken from Psalm 92 and verse 18. Psalm 92 and verse 18, and this is the amplified version. Okay, I'll read it once and then I will have everyone unmute yourselves and then personalize it to yourself. Are we okay with that? Yep. All right, so it says, growing in grace, they will still thrive and bear fruit and prosper even in old age. They will flourish and be vital and fresh, rich in trust and love and contentment. So here's what you'll do. When you unmute yourself, you read it and say, growing in grace, I will still thrive and bear fruit and prosper even in old age, I will flourish and be vital and fresh, rich in trust and love and contentment. So let's unmute ourselves and personalize this verse, Psalm 92 and verse 14 to ourselves. All right, unmute yourself and let's read it and you personalize it to yourself, don't forget. Let's go. Growing in grace, I, I will thrive 
and bear fruit and, and, and prosper and even in old age. I, I will flourish and will flourish and bring you right to and trust and love, rich in trust and love and contentment. Amen. And that shall be your portion in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, Oh, you're very welcome. You know, the, the, what we've spoken about tonight is a topic that's so dear to my heart. And I just want to pray over everyone on this call tonight. And I pray that God himself, the spirit of the living God, the empowerer, the spirit of God is the power of God. I pray that he will go and reach you wherever you are right now and lift off every trace of depression and ease off every trace of stress, empowering you, giving you power from within. The Bible says that he is the power that is at work in us, the Holy Spirit. I pray that the Holy Spirit will reach out to you wherever you are this moment and empower you to rise above every depression and every stress in the name of Jesus. Amen. I pray that he Amen. will take you from glory to glory. You'll never Amen. be low. You will never be down. You will never Amen. be depressed in the name of Jesus. Amen. I pray that Amen. he will empower you and give you true power to rise above the situations of life. Amen. And you Amen. will never be drawn back. You'll go higher and you'll be better. You'll have joy and your joy will be full in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, oh God, for hearing us tonight. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, we have. Amen. 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 Thank Amen. you so much, everyone, for joining in. It's been such a delight to have you tonight. It's been such a delight. And thank you again, Dr. Lydia Ling. It's been a blessing having you tonight also. We, we, we really appreciate you. God bless you all.